I'm Susan Euler. In this program, we're going to take a look at the Amarna period, a very short and controversial time in ancient Egyptian history, and yet it produced some of that culture's most beautiful art. People in the 1920s were mad about ancient Egypt. It was still the Indiana Jones era of archaeology. Any influential person with enough money and connections could obtain a concession from the Egyptian government and dig through the sands for buried tombs, temples, and treasures. While some of their excavation methods were crude by today's standards, nonetheless, archaeology advanced a great deal during this period, and many valuable discoveries were made. And with each new discovery, a whole host of products, from movies and books to soaps and cigarettes, all with an Egyptian theme, were marketed to an eager public dreaming of life along the ancient Nile. This love of all things Egyptian had begun more than a hundred years earlier when Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1798. A serious historian himself, Napoleon took along an enormous group of scholars, scientists, and artists. Their job was to study and record Egypt's ancient monuments, something that had never been done before. Their work was published beginning in 1809 as a comprehensive 23-volume set of text, plates, and maps entitled Description of Egypt. And it was Napoleon's troops who discovered the famous Rosetta Stone, which proved to be the key to translating hieroglyphics and opening up Egypt's history to the modern world. One of the wealthy men who came under the spell of ancient Egypt was the English Lord George Herbert, 5th Earl of Carnarvon. It was Carnarvon who funded the expedition that discovered King Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. Lord Carnarvon's ancestral seat was Highclere Castle, better known today as the setting for the popular television series Downton Abbey. Fabulously wealthy, Carnarvon was a very enthusiastic amateur archaeologist. He began funding digs in Egypt beginning in 1907. In 1914, he took over the concession in the Valley of the Kings that had previously been held by the American millionaire Theodore Davis. Several years earlier, Davis had uncovered a cache of embalming linens and tools, as well as the remains of a funeral feast, sealed in jars stamped with the name Tutankhamun. But no tomb was ever found, so Davis resigned the concession in favor of Carnarvon. Howard Carter, the archaeologist who supervised Carnarvon's digs, was certain that the tomb of Tutankhamun was located very near to where the embalming cache had been found. But just as excavations began, World War I broke out and the project had to be put on hold until the digging season of 1918-1919. Carter dug in the area where he knew the tomb had to be located for three years removing tons of sand and rock, but finding nothing. Finally, in the summer of 1922, Carnarvon decided to give up the quest, citing the huge amount of money he was spending for no gain. Carter, however, was not about to give up. He left Egypt and rushed to England to meet with Carnarvon at Highclere, saying that if he did not find the tomb that season, he would use his own money to continue the search. Carnarvon relented and decided to fund the dig for one more season. Carter returned to Egypt, and just four days after his arrival, on November 4, 1922, the staircase leading into Tutankhamun's tomb was located. King Tut's tomb was found. When news of the discovery was announced, people went wild. This was the first pharaoh's tomb discovered with its grave goods intact and the king still lying in his original sarcophagus. The enthusiasm that greeted the discovery of King Tut's tomb in 1922 is still going on unabated today. King Tut lived during what historians call the Amarna period. The Amarna period only lasted 61 years, which is a very short time when you consider that ancient Egypt existed as a unified country for 3,000 years. Nonetheless, it was a very momentous time, one that left a lasting impression on the Egyptian psyche. The pharaoh responsible for the changes that took place during the Amarna period was Amenhotep IV. Sometime during the first years of his reign, he underwent a religious conversion. Changing his name to Akhenaten, which means powerful or enthusiastic for the Aten, he decreed that the Aten was the only god that could be worshipped in Egypt. All other religions were banned. The symbol for the Aten is a sun with rays extending from it, ending in little human hands. 
The symbol was derived from the Egyptian hieroglyphic for light. The Aten, as the sun, was seen as the giver of all light and life on earth. And Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti were the Aten's chief priests. None of this went over too well with the general public. Since pre-dynastic times, the ancient Egyptians had practiced a religion that included many deities. The attributes and stories associated with these gods and goddesses changed over time as they were adapted to suit the needs of new political, social, and cultural situations. But in general, the basic mythology stayed constant. Sky gods were always central to the ancient Egyptian religion, so that aspect of the Aten was not considered unusual. Ra, or Re, Amun, Horus, and the scarab beetle Kepre are all examples of gods associated with the sun. But the idea of a monotheistic religion in which the Aten was the only god, not one of many, was a revolutionary new concept. Also revolutionary was the fact that the Aten could not be represented in anthropomorphic, that is, in human form, as was commonly done with Egypt's other gods. And Aten was considered to be both male and female. This probably accounts for the many depictions of Akhenaten in which he has both male and female physical characteristics, something we know he didn't have in life, at least not to that extent. So how do we know that Akhenaten did not look exactly like his portraits? Well, for one thing, we have his body. In 1907, Edward R. Ayrton, an archaeologist hired by Theodore Davis, uncovered a ramshackle unfinished tomb, referred to as KV-55, for Kings Valley Tomb No. 55. This tomb proved to be a mummy cache for 18th Dynasty Royals. The grave goods were scattered, and the coffins had all been opened. Only one still contained a mummy. However, the style of the portraits on the coffins confirmed that they were from the Amarna period. One coffin was very elaborate, and was obviously made for a king, since the image depicts a man wearing a pharaoh's false beard and has the hands crossed in the traditional posture of a monarch. And as luck would have it, this coffin still contained a body. The mummy had been unwrapped, so it was just a skeleton. But Ayrton and others believed that this must be the body of Akhenaten himself. Unfortunately, the cartouche that would have given the name of the king had been chiseled out, and the face removed from the gold mask to obliterate the identity of the deceased. This was another clue that the body they had found was Akhenaten, since he was hated during his reign, and his monuments were all destroyed or heavily vandalized after his death. That would certainly have included his mummy. Akhenaten had originally been buried in a city he built in the desert especially for the Aten. He called his city the Horizon of the Aten, but today the area is known as Amarna. Sometime not long after his death, his dream of an Egypt unified through the worship of the one god Aten fell apart. His city was ransacked and Akhenaten's and his wife Nefertiti's images were vandalized. Scholars think that King Tutankhamun must have moved his father's mummy, along with those of other members of the royal family, back to Thebes when he restored the old religion. This may be why the mummies ended up stored in KB 55, which is not far from Tutankhamun's own tomb. In any case, their skulls show that they were normal-looking people, not the space aliens with weirdly elongated skulls and slanty eyes as they are sometimes depicted. In fact, Judging from the shape of their skulls, they probably looked very much like the people still living in the region today, especially in Ethiopia and Sudan, which in Egyptian times was known as Nubia. So what did Akhenaten actually look like? There's never been an official forensic reconstruction done of his face, so I created one, based on several realistic, non-stylized portraits made during his reign. I'm pretty happy with the results. For the 10-Minute Professor, this is Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for tuning in, and make sure you watch our next program. Mm -hmm.